Welcome back to the Invest in Yourself podcast. Today's guest features former mobster Frank DiMatteo. During Frank's life in the Mafia, he was with three different crime families. The first one he was in was the Colombo crime family with Joey Gallo's crew. The second crime family he was with was the Genovese crime family when Vincent the Chin Giganti was the boss. The last family he was with was the DeCavalcante crime family. He was with Anthony Rotundo's crew. Frank talks about his life after Joey Gallo's crew, which is the Genovese and the DeCavalcante crime crime family. He wrote a whole book about it called Were We Really Cowboys? It's a very interesting read. Highly recommend it and it will be in the video description below. So today's topic we really focus on those two families. Frank's story with the Gallows is really out there but the whole Genovese and the DiCavalcante family he hasn't really touched on so today we go into detail with it. I think everyone will enjoy it. He really gives really good insight about these two families. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more interviews like this. Please hit subscribe to my Patreon channel. It'll be in the video description below. I just started this Patreon. I'm going to offer little videos from each interview that I do. Stories that can't be told on YouTube. In this interview in particular, Frank brought up a story about Sammy the Plumber and his encounter when he met him. That'll be on my Patreon, so that'll be in the video description below if you want to subscribe to my Patreon. $3 a month, nothing major. But without further ado, let's get into this episode. Hey Frank, how you doing, man? Good morning. How are you? Pretty damn good, man. Glad to have you on my show again. Thank you again. Probably the tenth time now. (laughs) Yeah, I want to come down to it, but you know your your story. You know, there's a lot of stuff that goes into what you went through, and even the life after being in Joey Gallo's crew. That's so. That's what I really wanted to focus on today, because you were also an associate of the Genovese and the DeCavalcante crime family. Yes. So which one came first to you after your, well, after leaving the gallows, what happened? Where did you go? After the gallows in 1976, uh, we went with, uh, uh, Genovese family. We went with Chin, my father so, and, and the gallows were very good, very close with, uh, uh, Giganti Chin for years. They've been very close. And, uh, when the, after the, uh, 74 war, in the gallo when they broke up winning the crew there was a beef and they a lot of guys left and they were you know and uh and um what happened was uh uh blast and those guys went to chin and they had a, a a sit down to make peace again because it was guys were shooting at each other again and they made peace and what happened was uh in 70 I think 76 there was another uprising again Blast went to, uh, or Blast or, or, or uh, Punchy went to uh, uh, Frank Iliano. He was a capo when they got made over there uh, in the Genovese family. Uh, they they made peace again, and they and they made uh, they got the that Gallo crew to break away from uh, Joe Colombo. Got everybody released, and they wound up going with uh, with Shin. So we went to New York with Shin for quite a few years and that's did, how we won the chin in, in new york did uh joe colombo really have any problem with releasing the gallows uh joe Colombo was a vegetable by then and yeah. had, and uh i don't i don't know it was andy mush or those guys no they had no trouble releasing them these guys were you know that crew was always a headache to them and uh and chin was very strong to get them released so it was pretty easy a lot of guys got released to Chin. Some guys went to Cambinos. Guys went all, all different places. Some mm-hmm. guys stood with Chin and, and, and that crew went to, into, into Chin's family. But and, no, it was pretty easy. Yeah, pretty easy transition, though. So, I mean, after, but I mean, so after the Gallows, I know that you were, you and your father were approached to join the Lucchese's. Now, was this after Genovese or before? Uh, that was. Right after we got released from Genovese, after we had that drug pinch, okay. we got released from Chin. Okay. And then uh, Chrissy Tick from Lucchese approached us and asked us to go with that family. And uh, my father called me in. We had, a, we had a bar on Millie Avenue in Brooklyn. My father called me in and he says, Chrissy, want to talk to you. And Chrissy asked me that uh, if you want to come over with him. And I looked at my father and I said to him, I go where Ricky goes, right? He just smiled at me, and uh, and he's okay. And 
my fa- I walked away, went to the bar, and my father told me that night that he told him no. He goes, he's fine right now. He don't want to go get involved over there. He's friends with him. If you need anything, he's there, but officially didn't want to go over there. Okay. And uh, we're still friends with Chris. He went to 19 hold. Those guys were friends with us. I know, but maybe about a, a year after that, uh, um, Anthony Rotunda got in touch. Uh, um, a guy named Louis Tadisi got in touch with us. He was with uh, Sammy the Plum out in uh, New Jersey, the Calicante family. And he said that to, to Anthony Rotunda just got strained out and he needed a, somebody to mentor him. So they asked my father to uh, to mentor uh, Anthony Rotunda. And that's why we wound up, my father said yes, because he was Anthony Rotunda's father's good friend, which is Jimmy Rotunda, which with the Calicante the Calcanti family in uh, Jersey, which is, he was a Brooklyn, he was a delegate in Brooklyn for the ILA. And he wound up getting killed about a year or two before that. Mm-hmm. So my father, no problem. Uh, uh, Louis Terisi and uh, Rudy, uh, I think his last name was Fu, Fumari, came over to the bar and asked Ricky to, to help out. And we wound up uh, uh, being with Anthony's crew. And uh, we got, uh, Spoke before over there, and we wound up going with Anthony, and we wound up with with uh, them from uh, I don't know. I I, I would say 82, 83. I think we got released in 82, 83 from uh, from uh, Vince uh, Chen, and we wound up in uh, with uh, with Anthony maybe eighty four or something like that. Yeah. And we went with with Anthony from eighty four to ninety nine or two thousand. Okay. Well, so now that we know the the premise and the timeline of, you know, the, the where, where you went after the gallows, let's expand more onto the the whole Genovese stuff. So when you went in with the Genovese, you and your father, or you know, you got into there, and did they have you go into any particular crew, or what was it? Because I mean, you were an associate of. Them. Yeah, we were with um, Punchy Frank Iliano's crew mm-hmm. in uh, New York. What happened was when uh, they strained out the. Uh, when um, when they got released from Colombo, a couple of guys were getting straightened out with uh, Chin. My father, um, Punchy, Blast, got all put up, and uh, my father refused it. And uh, and uh, uh, just stood with uh, Punchy and Blast, but he got he refused it. Uh, so uh, refused getting straightened out in that family. My father's a very funny guy. He didn't want he he with you. He'd be with you, do what he got to do. But he was a freelancer, even though he was you know in that crew. He was friendly with everybody. You know, a, a lot of people don't know. In my my father's house in in uh, on the water here had a house on the water in, in Garrison Beach. Every week he would have some family there or or skip or boss or something like that uh, at the house because he did a lot of work for a lot of people. So. We were very friendly with everybody. I mean, we were uh, the Bonanno guys we were friends with. They came over the house, uh, Lucchese, Chrissy Tick, um, um, Paulie Vario was a very good friend of mine, you know, of my father's. So these guys were at the house all the time. So he was very friendly with everyone. So when he, uh, when they want to, when they want to straighten him out in uh, in um, in the Genovese family, he said no. He had to, you know, give his alliance to them, and but not be straightened out because he felt that then he'd be owned. And uh, he says, then he couldn't do what he wanted because he, you know, he was dabbling a lot of things we don't supposed to dabble on. Mm-hmm. Uh, he just liked to be that way. You know, it was very well respected because he did a lot of work for these guys. So that's why he didn't get straight. He didn't refuse it. So we stood in New York with them for. Uh, my father was also good friends with Chin. Chin used to send a case of uh, Tanger champagne to my mother every holiday. So they were very close. Yeah. Uh, and we wound up in New York, staying there, and uh, we pretty much stood in Brooklyn as a as a crew. You know, the guys who um, went with uh, 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 Punchy and Blast, but we stood in Brooklyn. You know, we would go once a week to New York to see everybody, but we stood in Brooklyn, and we just did what we, you know, we did every, you know, every day, you know, whatever things we were doing, you know. So, uh, but we have to answer to uh, uh, Punchy at the time. Or if anything was going down, we would go to you know Chin, uh, 
my father used to go once every two weeks to uh, Sullivan Street to see Jen because he was very close with him. I drove, you know, sometimes it's in the car, sometimes, you know, if they invited you in, you go in, you know, at, at, at towards the first, let's say, four or five months, you sit in the car, you know what I mean? Because we're low, low man on a totem pole. But as, you know, you, you, as you get more familiar with everybody, then they start inviting you and she invited me and said, well, Frankie boy, doing a car, come on in. And I would sit, now I wouldn't sit at the table with them when they were talking. I would sit at another table, we're talking to somebody else that you knew somebody in the place. So as they would speak, I would sit on the side. It wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't my business to hear every word they said. So I would uh, not sit in the conversations. So my father and, and everybody used to go up there and we used to go up there and uh, and do whatever we had to do until we caught a drug pinch in that 82. And that's how we got released from Chen. Instead of getting killed, we got released. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty lucky right there, me, because, yeah. you know, a lot of these guys get taken out if they're in Dapinalin and drugs and stuff. So that's exactly what happened was that uh, uh, my father was so close with Punchy and Blast and did so much work for them and was pretty independent, even though, you know, he was with them, he, he wasn't with them. It was uh, it wasn't spoken for, you know. He wasn't made over there or you know over there. So uh, when Chin found out that we got all got pinched for that thing, he called uh, Punchy and uh, and asked what the hell happened. And Punchy told him, "Hey, listen, man, you know he's here, but this guy can go do what he wants. He's not uh, you know obligated in any way." So, but but uh, Chin turned him and says, "Well, that's okay." He said, "But he can't. They can't come around because it'll reflect on us." So we got called. We got called the next week into uh, New York, and 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 we got released from there. I said, you know, everything's okay, but don't come around for a while. And what happened was, we for two years we didn't go to uh, New York with Chin. Uh, uh, and then in, when Chin got pinched, we got called back to New York again, and my father started driving blast around again because he was very close don't forget my father was yeah. brother's bodyguard for eight, uh, eight years and then he wound up being uh blasted bodyguard for until uh, all that time after 68 to whenever this happened to 82 it was uh his body with him yeah so, i was gonna ask you a little bit more too about the chin what was his personality like because you know everybody knows that you know, they, how he would act and, you know, how he would portray himself in public, you know, like he had, you know, this mental disorder and stuff. I mean, from what Chin you was, understood. Chin, Chin was slick. He was slick, very serious guy, you know. But, you know, when he walked the streets, he did all that, you know, that show on. He was really, he was really smart. He was smart as a fox, man. But he put that act on. And uh, when we got in the club, you know, his, his robe was off. He's sitting down there, you know, uh, talking regular and, uh, you know, laughing about what he's doing and, you know, but not in a you know, big funny way, but he was uh, a little humorous about it, but he was a serious guy. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't call him chin. You know, you had to, ref, ref, you know, make the motions if you're referring to him. And if you spoke to him, you call him Vincent. You know what I mean? You know, when I came home, kissed him hello, I said, hello, Vincent. You know what I mean? So he was a real serious guy, good guy. If he liked you, you know, you're gold. You know what I mean? So, uh, uh, what what about the guys on the street? What do they think about his personality, like doing that? They, everybody scratched their head and how he pulled this off. You know what I mean? Because he did a good job of it, man. But you know, when you get into that club on Sullivan Street, it was a whole different, uh, whole different um, personality. He was a real regular guy, you know, the boss of you know of the family, and he acted like the boss of the family. You know, threw his rules and regulations down, and you know, took care of business, and you know, spoke well and. And uh, and then he just messed his hair up and put his robe up and went out. So it's time to go outside. He was a fucking character. The guy was brilliant. I mean, I mean, he fooled everybody. I mean, he fooled all their doctors, you know, like that. So this guy was no joke. He was pretty good at it. Now, is he crazy? They were, like I always said and everything, they, they were all crazy. You know what I mean? So yeah. <laughs> you know, how do you like, uh, defend crazy or, or dissect it? So, yeah, but uh, he was a good friend and he, but he was a real serious guy. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine it would you know, for the feds and everything, they're just sitting there confused and trying to figure out what the hell is this guy doing? You know, why, how is it, you know, that, but they knew that he was, eventually they came to the conclusion that, you know, he was just BSing around and stuff, but it was never. They always knew he was, they always knew that, but they, they just couldn't prove it because he, no. he had the doctors fooled and everything. Now, when he got pinched in that windows thing, you know, what? what's he admitted to it. He, they didn't 
they didn't um uh find out nothing. What happened was they were they were gonna pinch his son and everything like that, and he gave up the sh- he just gave up the show and took the pinch. He, he could have played the he could have played you know the, the same game, but when they would they wouldn't pinch his son, his brother, and he just said you know he was a real tough guy, real man. He says nah. You know, I'm not going to go that route. He goes, and he just and he just told the feds, "Yep, I'm the boss. That's it." Yeah, you know I mean, and, <laughs> and, he, and he gave up the shenanigans. They didn't prove nothing. He could have fought it again in that trial, but like I said, to protect his family, he get, he gave himself up. I mean, he was you know he, he was a real tough guy. He was a real gangster. Did you ever hear the thing about him saying like he was disappointed that John Gotti had brought his son into the life? Mm-hmm. What were your thoughts on that? <laughs> what, 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 no one liked. John was John Jr. wasn't very very liked. You know, I ran into a few times. I really didn't have the uh, uh, contact with him that we talk and shit or anything like that. But I was in his presence a couple of times, and he wasn't a friendly guy. They were really, you know, too rough, too mannerisms were bad. They were clicky. They were weren't very friendly. They were very nasty. But he was growing. He was a kid growing up too. You know, he was young in this life. He got strained out by his father. And uh, no, he wasn't well liked. <clears throat> Chin didn't like that, and Chin didn't like uh, John either, John, because he didn't sanction that hit on uh, Bully. So yeah, he, not really. He like, you know, he didn't like uh, John for that. So it was a lot of animosity between that that families. Yeah, I mean, it's with you know with the feds and everyone reported and stuff that you know Vincent was pissed off about that, so he had you know planned a hit against. Uh, to take John Gotti out, you know, they said that he was part of that whole, you know, bombing <clears throat> with Anthony Castle, the, you know, to, you know, the, but Frank DeChico was the one that ended up getting killed instead of Gotti and all that. So uh, you right. really did like it, man. <laughs> no, no, they, they put a hit on him twice. I mean, the first time with the bomb, they tried to get him again and they just, they couldn't get near him because he had a lot of killers with him, John. And he, and after the first one, he got even, John had even more protection around him. So it was, it was even harder to get after the first one. You know, they just messed up that first hit and got to keep to, 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 to Chico. And what happened was um, uh, the guy who was uh, fingering them just didn't uh, miss, didn't um, didn't see that wasn't John there. They made a mistake. And that's what happened over there. And it even got harder to go after John after that. Damn. Now, we were good friends with the, with the, John and because Bobby Borello, which is was down pressure sheet with us, was wound up being a bodyguard to um, John Gotti Senior, and he, he used to come to my house because we were friends from the old days, and and we were still doing some things together. So we were still friends with them, and uh, but we're neutral, you know. We just had friends, you know. Uh, which John was that? You said John Gotti Senior. Senior. Oh, Bobby, you, you. Bobby, Bobby Borello was, which was down Pleasant Street with us mm-hmm. originally. Wind up being Bobby uh, uh, Johnny John Gotti's uh, bodyguard driver, Damn. and we were still friends with him. So he used to come to my house and every other week, and you know my father's house every other week, and um, we did a lot of things together. So we had uh, some mutual friends with that Gambino family. Damn. There was other guys involved over there that you know that we did some business with because we Ricky was a freelancer, so he was able to do a lot of stuff. If they needed something, and Ricky had a connection because we had Joe Shep with us. Joe Chapani had the unions and the garbage. So if someone had a problem and Bobby and that and the Gambino family and uh, Bobby would reach out to a father to get in touch with Joe Shep. And so he always intermingled uh, something. So it was always, we were friends with a lot of people. But yeah, but Chin didn't like it. J- J- John or, J- or Junior. Yeah. Well, I mean, to expand a little bit more on, you know, your time with the, you know, Genovese, I mean, what else is there, I mean, that you can talk about that, you know? Nothing, because anything I did with them, I can't talk about, mm-hmm. except going to the uh, the club or going to his club or or going to the restaurant over there to, you know, some meetings and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. I really can't tell you, you know, really can't say, you know, what we did together as far as anything we were involved with or helped out on because... There's no uh, statute limitation on anything, and I have no pass. So, uh, mm-hmm. well, you know, and, and 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 then again, a lot of things were spoken about that I wasn't privy to. You know, what I mean, if I wasn't privy to it, my father used to keep me out. If I had to do something, I had to do it. You know, what I mean, but if it was something, if they sat down and Chin sat down and told Ricky something, or or, or Punchy told Ricky something that had to be done, and I wasn't going to be involved in it, they wouldn't tell you. It's not everyone's business. 
because the less people know you do bad things, the better thing it's better for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I see. Even okay. I was my father's uh, left hand man for, for 40 years, man. I drove 40 years. And uh, he still would tell me, he would sit at, he would sit at a table with, with Chin. I was, you know, I got invited to a table a couple of times and they would start talking about something. He would just look, give me the sign. He goes, well, you know, you can go have a drink. Meaning that that was my key that you didn't, you don't need to hear this shit. And I would get up, excuse myself at the table and walk away. I've done it many, many times. Uh-huh. And he did that to protect me and to protect everybody else, you know? So, yeah. uh, uh-huh. Those little things like that, but but uh, you know there was a lot of things going on that you know, you know that I just can't speak about. No, I hear you. Uh, so we'll, we'll segue into after <coughs> being with them. So I mean, the Lucchese guys had approached you, and then they wanted to maybe bring you guys in, and you know your father turned them down. But I mean, you, so, so we can talk about maybe a few of these guys that you know that approached you or that you were close with because it was in your book. You know, you talked about doing a, a criminal criminal business you didn't really go into details but like you talked about with Polly Vario and then you like again you said uh Chrissy Tig uh he was another Lucchese guy mm-hmm. and then I mean those are the two we could kind of talk about right now so yes, I mean like, we you know we, we we would be gas piping in because you know the with with the uh, tick in them and the 19 toll up in 18th Avenue 86th Street so we would run into them I never did nothing with Castle uh because we were friends with tick you know, if Chrissy Tick needed something for my father, he would come to my father personally. You know, Paulie Vario, my father used to go dinners with Paulie. My mother was good friends with Paulie Vario's wife or girlfriend. I don't know, second one or what, 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 <laughs> whatever it was. It was. My, mother, my mother and them used to go for dinner with them and, and my father. So, uh, you know, uh, C- Castle was not a friendly guy. And, you know, he did nothing wrong to us because we were friends and we were involved with him. And, uh, but you know, he wasn't a, he wasn't a real friendly guy, you know, and Amuso wasn't the uh, most friendly guy, but he wasn't bad to us. But if you're sitting back and looking at their personalities or how they acted, you know, you know, I wouldn't you say didn't know them. I met them and know them and sat with them and drank with them, but you know, uh, we weren't with them at that, to that point that, you know, telling you what to do or act, it might ask you a favor. Yeah. We would, we would, do, we would do the favor. Damn, man. Yeah, so, so, I mean, the, some more guys that you were around, man. I expect, you know, the, in the Lucchese, I mean, these guys would go on to be killers, serial killers and all this shit. You know, I mean, they took out a lot of guys. And, I mean, Anthony flipped, you know, and, you know, Vic, he's, I mean, he, he used to, is he still alive? I mean, he's still been in prison for all, all these years. I think he died in jail. I don't you know. I don't, he, I don't yeah. follow him. I think he might be dead. Yeah. yeah. No. Well, I mean, he, he spent a lot of time he, in there. He flipped. Didn't he flip? I, I think Anthony did for sure, but I don't know Vic. Did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know. I lost track of them. I know Gaspar died in jail. Uh, yeah, they both ended up staying in jail because I mean, uh, I think you know Castle he violated his uh, yeah. his witness protection yeah. stuff, or I don't know what the hell he did, but I mean, yeah. he ended up getting life in prison too. Yeah, they didn't they, they didn't trust him. He was a bullshit artist, so that's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, an, another few guys that you were. Around that you'd mentioned in the in the book as well as Anthony Peanuts, who Columbo? Columbo, yeah, Colum- Anthony Colombo. Did you know him, Joe Colombo's son? Yeah, that's what I think I got out of your book. I wrote oh. a note about it. Chris, no, Chris, I knew. Oh, see, so Chris is doing a podcast now. Yeah, Chris, I had a couple uh, a couple luncheons in Mobile Street because he was doing a uh, he did a show about being locked up on the yeah. clip. <laughs> a mutual friend of ours who did a book. Um, License to steal or something. It was a jewel decent for something. We, we had a couple of meetings in uh, New York with him. He was a nice guy. Oh, but strictly, you know, nothing the gangster was strictly, uh, you know, book, book and show and stuff like that. Yeah. So, I mean, he's even, a guy, he was a funny guy, good guy. I mean, you know, uh, you, so, you, so there's Chris, Chris Colombo that you're talking about, right? Yeah. So now, he has his own podcast. He just started doing it. You know, I, I don't know if you've seen it, but I think he just came out with the second episode and stuff. So, no, yeah, I'm maybe sure. maybe it could be someone, you know, me and you do a show with or something in the future, you know, yeah, get you Chris guys on. Guy. Chris is a good guy. I mean, he's funny. He's good. Got a lot of stories. You know, he was he was uh, young at the time, but he was uh, he's a little, probably a little older than me or maybe my age. I'm not sure. Yeah. So, I mean, even with you being involved with the gallows and the beef with Joe Colombo, I mean, he, how, I guess if you could talk a little bit, I mean, he was, how did he feel about you? 
you know, he, he knew that, you know, don't kill the messenger, man. You know, a lot of guys were friends at that time and didn't go in that Joey Colombo uh, problem. Some guys stood friends uh, through the whole thing, you know, like my father, after Joey uh, Colombo was uh, vegetated when he got shot, my father still sat with um, uh, Sonny Francisi, you know, and he's over there. But a lot of guys stood out, out of it. You know, they had the hard on for Joey, you know, and after the hard on for Joey, and th that was when they killed Joey. A lot of things cooled down after that, you know. So you stood uh, still friends or acquaintances or or did business with guys. So Chris was young. I didn't run into him then. I ran into him a lot later. Uh, nah, he understood that this is what we do. You know, uh, you can't blame everybody for everything, you know. Uh, you might be mad at shooters or something like that because, you know, they were involved right. in some hits and stuff like that. But the rest of the crew and the young guys coming up, uh, you know, your loyalties to where it's at. Uh, after it was all over, nah, we had no problem. We sat down friendly. He knew that was Ricky's son, and I knew that he was uh, Joey's son, and he knew I was that was over there. I mean, he had no problem with it. You know, it, it, it happened. It wasn't our fault. We didn't do it. I mean, you know, uh, so I had no problem with him. We, 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 uh, uh, I mean, is he hurt that his father got shot? Of course. I mean, you get hurt, you know, anytime it happens, uh, because that's who you're with and you know, that's where your little, little TV is. But, uh, no, you yeah, no problem. He's a very nice guy. I wish him the best. You know, he's got a great sense of humor, he's got great stories. He's a good guy to interview if you can. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to try. I mean, we're we're actually currently working on getting something lined up. So he can tell a lot of stories because uh, you don't have to tell you bad stories because he was not. A, I don't think he flipped. He's he's a regular guy. Yeah, yeah. But but uh, you know he can talk about because he got pants. He was on. Um, he has on. He was on a bracelet and stuff like that. But he has great stories of of what he could, what he did and what he went through with his father being you know being a son and like that. So he, he's a very interesting guy. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree, man. Well, I, I guess you know we'll segue into you going into the DeCavill crime, the De DeCavill Conte crime family. So how did that? What, what you, you did talk about it briefly, but yeah. I mean, how many years was the gap between the Genovese and the joining them? Not long. Um, Not long. When we got released from Chin, I got to say it's around seventy-two or something like that. It could be around those. I'm sorry, eighty-two around those years. We got released from Chin because of that drug pinch we got we, that we wanted to beat. We beat the drug bitch. Yeah. But um, what happens was uh, in between, Chrissy Tick came over with the little cases, and my father said no. And then we're at the bar, and I thought they said that uh, Louis uh, Tarisi and this uh, Rudy Fumari, I think Fumari, came over. They were two capos in the, the Calacante family. They come over, and they said that uh, uh, Anthony just got straightened out. They killed his father. They straightened him out, and that he needed somebody to school him. So my father wound up being uh, Anthony's uh, mentor, you know, to school him. And that's how we wind up in Jersey uh, family. And I, I would say that was like maybe 84, uh, 84, maybe 85. Mm -hmm. We got involved with them from 85 to 99. We stood Anthony. Anthony, uh, we were in Anthony, we put in Anthony's crew because my father was mentoring him and, and he would, uh, you know, be at my house every weekend, Anthony, and with his family, wife, and, you know, three kids. And they were young. You know, my kids were young at the time. And uh, and we did a lot of things together, you know. You know, we did, we did business together. We had a we had a, a adult video business together. We uh, we shook down a lot of places together, <laughs> you know. We got a lot of envelopes because we moved into a lot of places, you know. People ask for favors, and we moved right in and made sure we got our envelope every week. There's a lot of protection, you know, for clubs, for topless clubs, and we did a lot of protections for that. So we were very close, you know. Um, like I said, Anthony and his family were at my house every weekend. Uh, in fact, we had a whole crew, uh, his crew at the house every uh, weekend. Yeah. So we were very close with him, uh, did many things with him. Uh, well, I mean, one thing that I did take out of the book was uh, so Anthony had moved in on a club that was already owned by, you know, Vince and the Chins crew, you know, or it was under his protection, I believe. Yeah. You had mentioned that in your book. Kind of expand on that for the people. 
we wound up going drinking in a place <clears throat> and uh we tried to make a move on the place we didn't know it was chins and then we got word real fast that it was there and they told us to just back the fuck off and 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 we did it real quick and Man. that was about i don't remember what place it was i don't know what place, i just don't remember there so many places you know but uh yeah we just got we didn't know we didn't know you know uh, we went there got friendly they didn't tell us that they they didn't say nothing that, that they were with there with them which in and uh it was an opportunity you know uh, to move in and the idiot took our uh, help and two then, people two yeah. different crews and shit. Yeah. yeah i don't know why and uh but the work came back and we just backed off and said okay no problem we didn't know and they know gave us no hard time we said we didn't know you know if we sat at the table and said that but the guy Asked, we're sitting there, we're drinking there, or we're doing something over there, and the guy asked for the help. Well, he's a moron, and you know, but it's <laughs> it's, it's it's our place, and that's it. And that's how we wound up uh, backing off that. No, no headache and nothing like that. But that happens now and then. People don't tell you certain things, you know. I mean, because they, they, they these guys, a lot of guys are degenerates, gamblers. They don't want to go back to where they are with because they they owe the money or they don't want them involved or they're taking too much or they figure they go somewhere else. You know, there's a lot of people are stupid over here. So yeah. that's what happens, you know. Are, are you able to uh, expand on how you guys would go in there and collect envelopes or how you would even persuade someone to pick, kick up money to you? Listen, most of the time they needed the help and, and they asked our help. You know, if they know you're involved, you know. You know and they would ask, and then we would tell them, okay, you need this, or you want to watch, want us to watch the place, or somebody's busting your jobs, we'll go see them, but you're going to pay us. And every week, we would come up 500, you gave us 500 a week. Okay. Mm -hmm. We would stop in once a week and hang around for a while and get our envelope. And if we had to do a favor, we did the favor. Let's say somebody was bothering them, uh, another crew, uh, uh, outsiders, you know what I mean, would come down, we would show our presence and we'd tell them where we're at. And we would uh, save their ass if they, if they were getting shaken down or beat up or or whatever. And uh, you go in Friday, every Friday night, you go there and it'd be in a little envelope for you. Boom, and you get that, you get your little envelope. Man. Damn. So I mean, you guys were <laughs> collecting a lot of them, so they really started to add up. No, we made a lot of money. Yeah, we made. A lot. But don't forget, we were in a porno business all our life, so we made a lot of money from porno. So. Uh, <laughs> You know, not we being were, actors but hiring actors yeah, yeah yeah well we made films we made magazines we made everything so you know we we uh funded everything so we were always involved with the porno business and uh through my whole life even being in the, involved with the rackets we always had a legitimate business we had astro news so uh we always had a, a regular income and a business so until 2004 when uh, juliana closed us up but you know, from 1970 to 2004, we all worked consistently, consistently. So, yeah, we all had a lot of money. We, uh, between everything else we were doing and dabbled in and envelopes and people asked us to sell. We got involved in in, in um, metal business. To, uh, we got involved with the, uh, uh, the phone number business. We got involved. With, I mean, there's always something or, you know, that was legit that people needed your help and stuff like that. So we made a lot of money in clubs you know we had a, a, a place called paradise club we had that, that we got involved with and we made a lot of money through that place we were involved in another adult business that they needed us and we got cars and, you know we got the lease cars from that that was the payment lease cars and an envelope and free numbers in the porno papers and you know they called the 800 number and you we used to get a check every uh, month from them you know People call in to listen to that sex thing on the phone. They were hot. They were hot in the seventies and eighties. Those things were big. And once a month, you get called. Oh, got a check for you. Come down and get eighteen hundred, twenty five hundred, per you know per, per phone number. Wow. We had pages. Phone numbers. That was the deal. You know, we'll help you. You know, show a page in for us. Don't cost you nothing more. You know what I mean? And and, and, you, and you would. Uh, so it was means of ways to make money. You know, we dabbled in the drug business because somebody approached us. We weren't drug dealers. But uh, somebody approached, and being a hooligan, you you do what you got to do, you, you know. And it, you know, our stupidity, it was so uh, lucrative, you know. I, like I said, the first time somebody approached me, they wanted uh, uh, pills. I, I I don't know how to get pills. I don't know where to go. I called my uh, partner up. I said, "Hey, somebody wants the pills." He goes, "Okay, let me find out." And we we went and bought him for fifty cents, and we sold this guy for dollar fifty. 
You know, yeah, just up the prices just a little partner. bit. <laughs> yeah, and my partner at the time used to go pick up a thousand a time and go up and off to the sky. I never touched anything in my life, never saw nothing, touched nothing. But I, I had the uh, the connections because of being where I am. You know, you, have, you meet a lot of people, you know, a lot of things, and you get credit and stuff like that because of who you are and stuff like that. So that's how we wound up dabbling it. And then, uh, then with the with the uh, the coke. Uh, we weren't coke dealers. We just in Red Hook, man. And everybody there was big coke dealers down there. Somebody approached us and said, hey, man, we need tests. I said, well, we'll find it. Don't worry. About it. Just sit there. We'll find it. And we wind up, you know, uh, doing that. I mean, if they asked us to rob the, the uh, Statue of Liberty, we would have tried to do it. You know what I mean? Uh, that's <laughs> you know? We had no morals or something like that. It, you know, you sit there and say, oh, this is what we do, you know, and, and, and you do what you do. I mean, some guys don't dabble because they know better. We were we we didn't know better, you know. I mean, we did what we had to do, you know, uh, and we just did it until we got caught, and then you know, <laughs> then it shit. The <laughs> yeah, and, uh, undercover well, agents and stuff like that, and we got caught on that to a rat. That's how we got caught. We didn't get caught doing nothing. A rat came, got in trouble, and said, "Oh, by the way, we got Ricky from Brooklyn. He's with the Gallows, and you know." Bah, 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 bah. I said, "Really?" And they said, "Okay, go set them up," and that's what happened. We got set up by that, you know. I believe and, in your book you you even mentioned the guy's name that was became an informant. It was Ralph Mal Austin. Oh, okay. It wasn't this Ralph Garani. Well, Ralph was that was with the with the with, Ch with um oh with the, no the Calicanti family. He was a rat on that thing. Oh, okay. But he, that on our case was the uh, rat was Mel Austin, mm -hmm. and uh, we you know we got thrown out before we had to go to trial, and so he never had to testify. Against us, but we know who it was because we know who we're dealing with, so we know who the rat on the, on the case was. But uh, he never had to come out and, and um, testify against us, so they the, the feds kept him under Nassau, and Nassau kept him working for them, you know, because to do all the bad things to make us, you know, to catch us. But uh, we beat that in trial, just before trial. But um, it is what it is, you know, and, and that's how we got involved with that. But uh, 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 we had no intentions to do anything, you know. Like I said, in this world, you know, they ask you to, for something, and that's what we do, you know. That's yeah, we yeah. Well, well, I mean, we can also talk about, you know, Anthony. Uh, you know, he because he became an informant against, you know, everyone in that that family as well. I mean, you and your father. I mean, you guys kind of dodged his reign when he or his, you know, him him becoming an informant. I mean, how did that even work, or why did he flip? So people understand that. This is what happened in 1999. I was gonna, me and my father was getting trained. I got put up to be made in the, in that family in Jersey, the Calicanti family. Uh, I made my bones with them, and before that, and I got put up in there uh, this Christmas of uh, just before Christmas of '99. And what happens? My father grabs me, and we went to TGI Fridays and Ships of Bay, and he tells me that I got proposed, and he got proposed. He's not taking it again. He goes. But you got proposed too. If you want it, uh, you know, to, you know, it's yours to have. And I told him, I said, "What do you?" I exactly. Told him, what do you want me to do? I says, "It's up to you." He goes, "No, it's up to you." I says, "Well, give me some uh, recommendation. Tell me what to do." And he goes, "Take it." He goes, "You know, you deserve it. Take it." I said, uh, "Okay, no problem." He says, "But leaned over, he grabbed my hand, and he goes, but if you, he says, I tell everybody, but if you fuck up, he goes, I'm the one who's gonna kill you.'" Damn, man. I, I remember you telling me that. I had a dues and water in my hand. I just looked at him. I just smiled at him. And I said, no problem. Just like that. I said, no problem. And uh, we drank and drank. And, you know, we talked about other stuff. And, you know, he schooled me on uh, some stuff that, uh, you know, what I had to do and not do. And blah, 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 boom. And what what that button comes with. You know what I mean? You know, your obligation and everything like that. Because we were never obligated. We always pledged our loyalty to no matter who it was, but under no obligation. You know what I mean? So this time you're going to be obligated, and it changes the whole game. You know? Yeah. So he explained the rest of the thing to me. So that was let's say December first, late December. Anthony winds up getting pinched. What happened was that whole Jersey crew got pinched, and they uh, got arrested. So getting strained out in in December didn't happen. In January, late January, Anthony was uh, in jail preparing for trial right you know we would go see him and very close with family and a night 
uh, let's say a Friday night, his wife calls us up and says, we're going to, I need some money for uh, pay some bills. So my, I, I, my father wasn't around. So I drove my mother to along Staten Island and I gave her five, and we gave her 500. Figured she needed, he was in the can. You know what I mean? She needed a couple of dollars. They, they had good money, but we didn't question it. You need, you call me, you need money, we'll give it to you. And we gave it to him. We had lunch in Staten Island and we left. The next morning we get a phone call that they took Anthony out of circulation. Hmm. When they take you out of circulation, we knew it was a problem. But we were scratching our head because we were his wife the night before. She didn't say nothing. She couldn't say nothing. So that day, uh, after that phone call, we drove to his house. It was gone, packed up and gone. You know what I mean? So he had a beautiful house in Staten Island. So we said, "Uh uh-oh. He flipped Anthony. Then we found out the course of the week that uh, Vinny Ocean's flip, which is boss. And this guy, Anthony Copper, flipped. Which is another car, another guy in the, in the in the family, and two other guys. So Anthony was now screwed. You know what I mean? Yeah. He, he did a lot of work for them, or he was on some work with them, and he was done. So he flipped. He says, "I'm not sitting here." The boss flipped. The underboss flipped. You know, the two other guys that I did work for, they flipped. Now I'm going to jail for life. He goes, "You know, I'm not going to jail for life for these guys." So uh, he went to flipping and going into the you know, witness protection program. But he made a deal that he would not take out any binding his crew. That was his deal. He'll go um, you know, seniority and up. He mm-hmm. will go to the heads, the coppers, the underbosses, anything he knew in other families, a boss, underboss, but he would never, he didn't uh, take out anybody in his crew. And so none of us got pinched. Wow. So we got, we got caught in, we brought, brought in for questioning and we, we played the same game. I have no idea what you're talking about, bullshit. And they asked, they asked, and we said, no, 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 no. no we're just friends, blah, 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 boom. And uh, uh, my father, it was like now late, twenty, maybe 21. And uh, my father says, you know, uh, if anybody calls you, don't answer. He goes, because we don't know who's good, who's bad in that family no more, because everybody was under indictment. But what happened was that the Jersey family, we we're a Brooklyn crew in the Jersey family. We, not everybody knew, you know, knows us personally. We, you know, we went there once or twice a month. We were not there because it was a meeting. We saw Vinny. I know I, I, I've been quite a few parties with Vinny, but but in business, something like that, we were involved with Jersey business because we, we we're a Brooklyn crew. You know what I mean? You know, turning into them. They won't turn into us. So it, it didn't uh, affect our life. So we didn't know who, who was who, who was doing what was bad. And on their end, they didn't want to come approach us because they don't know on our end who was good, who was bad, and them being watched. So we, we got released. <laughs> Again. <laughs> we went, we, a couple of guys went there. My father, a couple of guys I can't mention, still friends of mine, went there and said, what are we doing? What do you want? And they said, "What do you want to do?" He says, "Well, we were with that guy. He's gone." It's okay. You don't want to be here. Goodbye. And they never asked no questions. And and that was it. And that whole crew, Anthony's crew, walked away. And that's how we wound up walking away. And that's the answer. Says anybody comes calling you or, and, and don't answer, and I'm going to Florida, and we wound up leaving for Florida. <laughs> yeah, so you really dodged a bullet. I mean, just yeah. by being in this crew and stuff, because I mean, he could have just flipped on everyone, but for whatever reason, he just he said, "You know what? I'm not going to put all these other guys down." And Anthony could have put out. Anthony could put us all in jail for life. He's good. He could have been in life. I mean, would have been. We would have been. I would have been here. I wouldn't be here smiling. Trust me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I don't. And I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't. I say it now. I say it forever. I wasn't in a position. I mean, I was in a position one time when the when the law came to me and they, you know, and I, I was doing it. I got caught in that drug and it was 25 to life bid, five of them. You know what I mean? And it's that scary, you know? And uh, the DA grabbed me and says, all you have to do is say your father set it up and you walk. I just looked at him and laughed. I said, I see you at trial. <laughs> and I read, read to my father and told him, oh, this is what they said to me. He just looked at me and says, Keep your mouth shut, and we fight this to the end. And I just looked at him. I said, "Okay, you know what I mean? No thought of ever, ever, of even contemplating to do something like that. 
But don't forget, I'm with my father. I loved my father. It wasn't just gangster stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I could never, never done that. You know what I mean? Uh, but also, you know, uh, you know, I'm not in these other guys' shoes, so you really can't speak for them. Why people do things? I can only speak for myself. You know, and yeah, I can no. say that because I didn't do it. And I can, you know, they can say you're bullshitter. That, you know, or oh, you would have foot. Uh, you know, <laughs> different people do different things. You know, it's it, you know when I always said when you're not brought up in this thing and you're not it's in your gene you know and you just want to be this thing it's easier to flip it's easier to you know not be sincere or love these guys see i love these guys i mean i jump in front of a bullet for these guys i i bodyguarded a lot of uh big guys and they you know when you bodyguard somebody you know you guys you guys step step in front of a bullet or do bad things and uh when it's in your blood like that you know, you don't you don't go bad as, as fast, you know, because you gotta you got the love for these guys because you wouldn't do it if you didn't, you know. Other mm -hmm. people do because they just want to be gangsters and they and they they didn't they don't grow up with the with being mentored. But I was mentored by my father. I was with Larry Gallo, Joe Chapani was which is a legend in this world. His yeah. uncle Joe, man, he he sat with me and, and you know, detailed and not to do this, Frankie. Don't drink this much, Frankie. You know, I mean, you, you know, <laughs> don't do no drugs. That's why I never did a drug in my life because it would say, "You drug wouldn't kill you, myself." So I, I never did a drug in my life. You know, <laughs> drank enough for, for people, but yeah. uh, and they yelled at me about that too. So, but you know, it's a different world. You grow up and you, 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 it's part of your gene. You know, so you don't go bad as as fast. You know, and you got honor and you got uh, it's in your mind. That's why some guys do like bids and they don't flip. A lot of guys doing long bids could. Could 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 open up, and they just said, you know, this is the world. This is what I choose. And their honor is is you know is um is stronger than uh, staying in the street. You know what I mean, mm -hmm. and they just very honorable people, you know. And yeah. They grow up in the ranks, and that's what they do. That's the difference between other guys. I you know that that turn that turn. You know, um, you know uh, they get mad. You know, I can see real easy why. Uh, uh, guys, uh, when their bosses go bad, and and, 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 and that can see we have yeah. no animosity towards Anthony because Anthony protected us. Did do we condone what he did? Of course not, but he did the right thing by us, man. You know, really good, you know, and and we can see why he, he did that. I mean, if you're over there, your boss flips, your underboss flips, you're sitting there holding your pecker. I mean, what kind of honor you want me to, to be? I mean, I didn't do nothing wrong, I'm here honorable, man. Do you want me to lose my wife and my family because you're a rat? And you want me to bite the bullet? I can see why they, you know, things yeah. like that happen. Then there's other guys that get caught uh, selling junk and, and you know on their own, and they get in trouble. And then they, oh, I want to beat this, and he take everybody down under them. So you know, there's a lot of different reasons why these people do these things. Yeah, I mean that's true. I mean that is. Yeah. So you know, Anthony was a good friend, a student for many, many, many years, and uh, uh, did a lot of things with him. Like I said, we, we got involved a lot of business and stuff like that, and. Then they got they got that pinch, and then you know, all those guys in Jersey got pinched. It was a big case, you know. A ton of guys went down, and uh, that's what happened over there. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, you eventually went on to retire, and you got out of all that shit, and did your own thing, man. Down, you know, going to Florida and stuff. So, I oh, mean, you're, 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 and, you know, you want to sit here and talk about your stories, and <laughs> you know, I mean, exactly. some of them, <laughs> not all yeah, of them. I mean, whatever you can talk about, you know, you can talk about, but. Uh, I mean, if I could, I could tell some really interesting stuff, but yeah. and make it a little interesting. But yeah, there's no statute limitation, and and uh, everybody's dead, and I really can't get nobody in trouble except myself. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. you yeah. might what? as well not, because we ain't gonna. Yeah, I mean, yeah, what no, I, tell you. I, mean yeah. I wrote in the book that it, you know about a couple of hits that you know, and I said who the shooters were that the you know that, but they were dead. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So when I turned Thank around you. and said Bobby and somebody else was involved in the in the Shiraz killing but okay you know i said it but bobby's dead <laughs> you know what i mean i, I, I can't, can't go on. after him <laughs> nah. no. and they're gonna bring me in i'm gonna say listen like i always say i was privy to it after the fact i'm not supposed to say it's hearsay you know yeah, what i mean exactly uh, so we lucked out in a, in a lot of ways like that so you know no. that's what we wanted to be you know going to florida and get involved in the more legitimate businesses. And then I became, you know, like in 2007, you know, I started that magazine, Mob Candy Magazine. And from there on, 
you know, pretty legit and, and you know, uh, lose a lot of connections that needed no more. But still, still friends. I mean, still got friends. No one's mad at me. Just can't bother with them, you know. Yeah, since you went out and going public, you know what I mean? You wrote all your books and everything. Yes. And he just, yeah. Like I said, when I was doing a magazine, I why you guys come up to me and want to tell me stories? Couldn't. Don't tell me, don't tell them I told you, but they want to tell me stories. <laughs> you know what I mean, and, yeah. and, and then there was another guy who said, ah, Don't talk to me, he's no fucking good. He's, he's writing magazines. Yeah, one one guy's made to want to tell you stories, and one guy wants to uh, talk bad about you. So after that, yeah. I see you know, they're all fucking morons. I mean, you can't, how, how can one guy, one guy uh, like you and, and, and tell you stories, and another guy, uh, ah, don't go talk yeah, to you. exactly. <laughs> I ain't gonna let it affect my life. Like, no. I don't talk about these guys anyway. Fuck no. about them. Yeah, they I mean, you did your own thing. Stories. They weren't in my life. You know what I mean? I mean, we knew them, and they're, good, they're all made guys. But it goes to show how crazy it. one guy wants to give you stories, and another guy wants his ah, chase you. You know. So <laughs> I just after that say, you know, fuck it, man. Whatever happens, happens, and I'm gonna do what I got to do. I try to the magazine for the eight years. I just tried to do old stories. That's why it was almost a nostalgic magazine. I would stay away from anything that was current. You know, yeah, and, just to, and to this day, you in trouble. I, you know, I do the magazine. I came on a magazine in November and it was current. You know, it was a uh, non-current, you know, it was just interesting old stuff, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, I just keep on doing that. I started writing the books because I wound up uh, a couple guys approached me, friends, you know, not to do with the life and said, you got so many stories and this is that's interesting. You with these Gallo guys, I mean, they're fucking historic. You know I mean, <laughs> yeah. they're, they're you're sitting with a midget five days a week, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's, I really enjoyed yeah, this yeah. book, the and, book. And that's what happens, and that's why I wound up writing it. And then um, I self-published uh, "Line in the Basement," which the only one you know, I'm proud of that was, you know, was the hardest one to do. And and, it, and the uh, of the uh, the uh, publishing company found it online, and and they gave me a contract to to redo that book, and to and now I'm on my sixth book with them. We yeah. just came out with, you know, I just came out with the gigantic, uh, the cigar, gigantic. The cigar. Right? Um, what was his name? Uh, no, Carmine Galante. 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 Uh, <laughs> you wrote the, the whole damn book. You're already forgetting. <laughs> you know, it, because I already got a, a new contract in, 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 uh, and we just did a new book called oh. uh, Red Hook. And mm-hmm. I just turned it in uh, two weeks ago. So oh. I forget about the, all the research and all we know about the last book because you've got to concentrate on a new book, which is took six months. I turned it in uh, August, uh, July, uh, 30, July 50. I turned it in. Should we come out next year? It's called uh, Red Hook. Uh, I think it's called Ground Zero. It's about all the uh, gangsters that came up through Red Hook from turn of century to, to, to now. That's I'm sure there's I'm a lot of them. <laughs> there's got to be a lot of them. Oh, there's millions came out through Brooklyn. You know the white, the Irish crews. And we talked about all that. Yeah. Well, I guess everybody got that to look forward to. So, I mean, just just stay up to date with Frank. I'm gonna put his oh, links yeah. in the video description, all your books, man. So and your magazine, so people can check them out if they want to buy them. And I mean, you got anything else you want to leave the people with? No, I just I mean, go to the website and buy some of these damn books. I can make I can spend some money in Florida. <laughs> you heard of here, man. Get some good books. They're really good. I like the one, the one that we this whole show was based off of. You know, where we really cowboys, life after President Street. That was yeah, a that, really good one. I, I put a lot of stuff in that book about the that uh, you know the Jersey crew. There's a lot of stuff in there. So you read it, yeah. so you know it's a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I know, man. I made a lot of notes for this show. So I recommend it to anybody watching this. Please check out Frank's books because you know he does a damn good job on doing research and his writing. I mean, it's it's really good. I, I think it's very professional how you and your partner do it. And you guys re- make some really good quality books. Thank you. Frank's got one very interesting story. Not a lot of guys traveled from different families like he did. So that's why I thought it was really important to bring him on and give his perspective on what it was like to go from family to family. So I hope you enjoyed this. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share this video with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content. Also, please be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel for more interviews like this. Frank's book will be in the video description if you want to check it out. Again, I highly recommend it. It's a phenomenal book.
look. And at the end of this video, a Mafia playlist will pop up of all my other Mafia related interviews. Last thing that I'll bring up as well is I just started a Patreon channel for this podcast in particular. So if you want to go over there, subscribe. It's $3 a month. And Frank's going to go into a story about the DiCavalcante crime family boss encounter that he had with Sammy the Plumber. It's very interesting. I know you guys will enjoy it if you enjoyed this interview. I hope to see you over there, and we'll see you on the next one.